I think I'm just going to go in order, right? I'm going to start with Dr. Ramatu. And my first question is, considering that you've been involved in politics on the national level, local level, and internationally, considering that you are the representative of Nigeria to Russia, Russia and Moscow currently, and the chairperson of the Alliance of Political Parties across Africa, right? What, looking at the historical and current situation for women's representation in politics, in Nigeria in particular, would you say that things have improved or are they getting worse? And beyond representation, do you think that things have improved in terms of the amount of power women have within Nigerian politics? Well, good morning. Uh, great audience and um, citizens of this country. Of course, this question and this event is coming at a very good time especially that the 2019 election is just by the corner here in Nigeria. Apparently, we must not fail to address issues uh, that have one way or the other been excused or handled mildly, boiling to women participation in politics in Nigeria. I would like to talk about why political parties just feel content with having women bear the name just women leaders, women mobilizers, director of women mobilization, women affairs is and that, and women are yet to unleash their potentials and the space is not given. That is the truth. How are we looking at addressing these issues that we allow women you know, to contribute immensely in nation building. Women do have the skills, but in the political space, especially in Nigeria or other African countries, unlike uh, 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 some civilized clients. We have women tied to the aprons of the men, where you just have to be and make a career, the man you marry, the man you date, Oh, who is that father and who is that husband? What about who is she? Whatever happens to her qualifications, to her political sagacity, to her competence, to her capacity, to her persona, is it because she's a woman? We must look at this, that the political space is predominantly men, yes. But besides that, Women are there with all that it takes. And women must take the bull by the horn just like we are doing now. And we are leaving nothing unturned in the 2019 election, as you can see us trooping you know, out. We must move women to the hem of affairs, irrespective of who that woman is, what the background is, to make what matters the competence, to make what matters what she has to offer. We are not saying invariably that women have not occupied or have not played one role or the other in Nigerian polity, but we are saying it isn't enough. We need the space, we need the engagement, we need the recognition. And there are so many uh, um, steps being taken within the country and even within Africa to make sure that women are properly carried along in recognition of their person, in recognition of their intellectuality, in recognition of what it is that is the A's for the men that is turned around to be the minuses for the women. If the woman is established, self-opinionated, yes, but she has all she's, it takes, she is labeled arrogant. In Nigerian space, she might not go anywhere. Must a man be subservient before he gets somewhere? No. Men are being picked by competence. They look for who is best. Why must a woman be picked? looking at who her husband is, or she is, who she is dating, or where she is coming from. Must you like her face? You don't need to like her face, like her attitude, like anything about her to engage her as a leader or somebody competent as the driving wheel. No, you've got to like what she has to offer. You've got to like her brains, and you've got to deal with it. We are appealing. We are not forcing. 
that women are speaking loudly this time around. Enough of the women, these women that take the women for who really they've come to be. They are citizens. We are indigenous. We are mothers. Women, if you check invariably, even in the legislative arm, form predominantly, if you, if you look at them, representing the underrepresented group of people, the vulnerable, the children, the tribal ethnicity, you know, ethnic uh, groups and religious groups. If you look at these women, they are passionate in this nation building and discussions. If we do have many women in the legislative arm, Nigeria might not even find itself in the legislative executive mess we find ourselves today. Because women just like the post-genocide Rwanda would have been able to force very intimidating caucuses that will call to order what is not, you know, in the direction of the progress of the nation. It will not be about whether you like the president or he belongs to your political party. No, it's going to be about what is good for the nations moving forward, the nation's development, the economic development, the infrastructural de development, and enough immediately you get there about what party you belong and who caused the shot. We don't care. We want development. Just like a mother does to her son. We Thank must you. go somewhere and women have come of age. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think just to riff off some of the comments that you made, I would like to ask Mrs. Bintamuazu, considering that you're the women leader, right? You're the chairman of Kaduna State APC Women's Forum. Um, and Dr. Mata has just mentioned how the women leader title or the women's forum space is a tool to actually limit women's power within political institutions rather than um, giving women the opportunity to be leaders by rights, without qualification. Has that been your experience as a women leader? And do you think that there are ways that the power of women leaders can be expanded? Um, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ramadu Tijani has spoken uh, a lot on the issues that uh, women face in line of politics or leadership. Uh, as a chairperson of the APC Women Forum, I have experienced a lot in line with championing the leadership of the, of the group. Uh, uh, not, um, uh, not that uh, it's really a problem, but uh, the women themselves encounter a lot of challenges through their, their men folk. Uh, they are not given the right space as just as she said and at the same time there is a problem of funds in 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 line with uh, trying to see that uh, they they pursue their intention that is in wanting to to vie for positions or to to do what is needful of them to do in the political arena um, I agree to what she said, and uh, honestly speaking, uh, the women, I mean the men are not doing good to the women. Uh, they are not giving us space, and they know that uh, we women are very passionate, very dedicated, committed for any cause that is given to us. And uh, they know that if we are there, really we're going to do better than themselves. Though they try as much as possible to see that they block all chances. Not only in being a leader of a, 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 a forum, but in all aspects of leadership or engagements. Women always do the best. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I would like yeah. to ask if you could share with us some specific examples of the ways in which men prevent women from being effective. Okay, the reasons the reasons why they prevent us is they know that we we, we have the potentials, we have the know-how, we are so com compassionate, we're so committed, and you know we are God uh, fearing more than them, and they are so greedy. <laughs> they are so greedy and selfish. If 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 they get the opportunity, they take care of themselves and their own. 
But a woman always like to make a, a landmark in anything she does. She likes to, to affect anybody that she comes across with. Be that person her family, wherever she is, she likes to put in her best. But the men, they think of themselves and theirs. This is it. And the fear they have is that anywhere they, 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 they happen to be with us, we are going to outshine them with these qualities. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting indictment of the, the motivations of male politicians. But um, so one of the women who's written about the process of vying for elect elect elected office in Nigeria, Asia Osori, mentioned that part of the problem is that the Nigerian political system is designed for elected officials to plunder rather than to serve. And you've just mentioned that male politicians tend towards greed and selfishness in ways that female politicians might not. But I, I want to ask, is it really true that there is a clear gendered difference in the motivations of Nigerian politicians. And if you do believe it's true, what do you think are the ways in which women politicians differentiate themselves and their motivations from those of the male politicians that we seem to all agree are greedy and yeah. selfish? Yeah. And beyond that, so that's the first question, what are the ways in which they differentiate themselves? And beyond that, there's the general idea that women should support women politicians when they're vying for office. But we don't necessarily see that when women are elected into office, they champion the causes of women citizens. So do you think that that's a responsibility that women politicians have, even if they're differentiating themselves from male politicians in general? Do you think that women politicians have a responsibility to women citizens? And if you do think so, can you share with us some, some specific examples of that sort of commitment to women in particular? Yeah. And, and that question is for all three of you. Okay, so um, talking about women encouraging other women, seriously, I, I would say um, that one of the problems that we face in politics as women, for example, I am, I'm not new, in, I can't say I'm new into politics, but I'm like in my constituency, I'm like the youngest aspirant right now. I'm aspiring to be in my state house of assembly, Kaduna State, yeah. So um, one of the things we're faced with as women is that a lot of women, especially the older ones, honestly, they have been into politics for a very long time. They do not like to support us. Yes, and it's very sad. And we are, you know, pressing for progress. And we are saying, look, we want more women in parliament. People that can represent us very well. Because, you know, if you have a woman in parliament, there are some certain laws that many men may not really understand. But you as a woman, for example, you will know it and you want to, you know, try and see how you can bring one or two ideas on the table. So, what am I now trying to say? From the party structure, I, when, when we start from the primary election, where it's just, the sole, um, it's just the sole business of the party members, that's where it starts. And in the party structure, you find out that the only chance they're giving to women is maybe the woman leader, just like my big auntie here. You understand, you're just giving that, not that you're not giving the opportunity to contest, but even if you do, Sincerely, they may not even support you. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, yeah. but um, so I want to ask if this construct of the women leader or the specific space that has been created for women in politics is part of the problem. Because you say that you get more support from men. Might it be because they understand that your ascent is limited in a direction that they have no interest in in the first place? Mm -hmm. And then if women are unwilling to support you, might it also be because they feel like there's a niche that is the most likely space for them to occupy. And the more women there are in politics, the more competition there is for that small space. If you agree with those things, do you think that there are ways that the space that women can occupy can be constructively expanded so that we're not all competing for the same tokenistic position within politics? Well, I think I would like to, I would like to take that. Um, when you look at the situation, it's not a um, because there is the women leader position, or women this, women that. I think it also has to do with the psyche of the people, of Africans. We are battling here with even um, uh, societal bias. We are majority either by religion or by um, uh, a certain culture, feels a woman must not be heard, you know. 
a woman should be behind, a woman cannot lead, a woman is, you know, supposed to be subservient. And then this uh, 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 psyche, you know, goes and plays a long, you know, uh, 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 a key uh, uh, contributor in the uh, uh, reasoning of the men especially. Now look at the political space. I will speak to you from a background that you will understand very well that I've gone round within this cycle. Haven't been the immediate past president of the Women Council of the African political parties. Before I, the same thing propelled me. The same thought process that why must it be a woman thing? So when it was the general election uh, uh, in, in Tunisia, I decided to contest for the seat of the presidency of the African Council. But you see, with the, with, with the enlightenment, with the advocacy, men came to terms, you know, at that level, that women, if competent, if they do have the A's and what it takes, should be given the chance. Even though that election, I will tell you, was contested more than three times. At the point when they announced it, I didn't know. <laughs> I had won. Because eventually, when they said, okay, collegiate, we were only three women in the whole, you know, uh, uh, 48 countries that were participating. All others were men. But guess what? The three votes I didn't get were from the women. In fact, one looked up to me, I think she's from uh, uh, Senegal, and said, you, President, do Africa? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, I was like the king, and the other elderly woman from Ghana said, we have been here for too long. You just came. You small girl president, lead Africa? No. So it was been the men. In fact, the most dreadful. I was scared of the Arabs that they might not give a lady a chance. Gave me more, 75% of their votes. Because we had to debate, we had presentations to do on African Silk Road, on how you move it, what you intend networking. The whole lots of it. So what happens to that competence in Nigeria? We've got many women. We've got to go out, look for them in various fields, encourage them. The funding will come, even from civil society organizations and even individuals or companies, when they see the potential, when they see the support from political parties, when they see the body language of the men that they've come to terms with women leadership. I didn't say woman leader. Women. A woman at the helm of affairs, be it the Senate, is she got going for the Guba? For instance, you take the local council, it's like putting a horse through the eye of a needle to say a woman will come for local government chairperson, except if she's made an administrator. Or better still, she's somebody's wife that they will go speak to the husband. He is that figure. So you've got to tie yourself to that apron to have a man whose name rings a bell that we make them remember that it's because of her husband. Her husband was the former, who is the president, who is the vice president. And even if she's not competent, she goes and she beats you hands down. Except again, if the woman is ready to go down some other ways and for anyone not ready to compromise that decency, I am sorry she finds it tougher to crack the ceiling glass, the glass ceiling. She, she does not transcend beyond this particular level. And when she gets to, it's like it takes eternity. All this we must look at by advocacy. We must be, again, be able to look at mentorship. We must also speak to the wives of the governors who happen to be fortunate, of course, to be the wives of the leaders. I'm speaking to one here, she's here. <laughs> OK, I'm looking at all of you. I know most of them are watching. It's one Herculean task and your responsibility to speak to your husbands. Especially where the political setting and political parties, for instance, in this 2019 election we are going into, most of the delegates belong to the governors. Let's speak it through, Tam Point Blank. So how do you find a lady? Sorry to cut you off. Could you please explain what the concept of delegates OK, is? I will take you there. When you have a party setting, when you have a political party setting, you go through processes. But first and foremost, being a member of the political party, being a card carrying member of the political party, eventually must be favored to emerge as a delegate. 
How do you get favored to emerge as a delegate? Must be favored and anointed by the governor or by the political juggernauts. Might not be because you're competent. She just did, you know, spoke well, and I appreciate this lady. And the but role and the role of the delegates in deciding. The role of the delegates themselves. <laughs> when you elect, but I will say when they rubber stamp them <laughs> into emerging as delegates, they forget their main role. The role is to elect the people that will contest, that, that will participate in electing the people that will contest at the local government level, at the state level, at the national level, leading to you know the election of the president, the governors, the, uh, the, the, the local government, and so on, are the supposedly function of the delegates. But because they are just anointed and baptized and handpicked to be delegates, some just come for nothing else. For the few that come, know that money must come from the principal who is the person contesting. From inception that it comes to contest as a delegate, the principle is not that I am resolute to pick a person that will serve and represent my immediate community and constituency. He is coming just for that person. Nah, nah, monio. They, they, sometimes it's even 10,000 K. Hello. It is already mortgaged from time immemorial. How many people will afford that money? Besides the money, even if you come with a whole lots of money, there will be the state apparatus, can you fight the government? So when you have these people already in place, from the beginning, like we've done congresses, most parties already have their delegates ready. Tell me how the woman is just going to come from somewhere because she's competent or because she says, no, I have what it takes, and I think I want to liberate the women. I want to move this, my constituency forward. I want to do the, no matter the beauty of her mani manifestos, she is not looked at. In fact, they find her a threat. They say, cut down that girl. And then the next thing that happens is that the delegates are just like those dancers who dance to a certain drum. And then they come there, they, there is a mindset. Like in some states now, I will not mention, it is just been done. You are going for the Senate. It is finito. You are already the rep. You step down. Man. You step down. If you don't step down, you know what I will do to you. Hello. What happens to democratic process? Uh, How much more much. of the women we are talking about? It's quite thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the some of two of the things that I, I think are most problematic for women trying to access elected office. The first thing is that everything runs on money. And the second thing is that incumbents are often anointed, or even when the incumbent can't come back for whatever reason, then the incumbent will name somebody else who is anointed to then take that position. So technically, we don't really have a democratic process. And then the question becomes, for people who are competing based on the principles of democracy, including women who are vying for office, can you succeed, regardless of your gender, in a system that does not have a democratic process to begin with? I contested for election 2011 for the seat of House of Reps. Kedwina North. I'm quite sure some of my supporters are here. I've seen one or two of them when I came in. I won. My mandate was stolen. And it's all about this history of anointing. This will be the senator. This will be the House of Reps. They share within themselves. But that did not make me, you know, lose hope in politics. Rather, it has increased my hope and strength to keep on struggling. At the moment, I'm not contesting. But in any ramification in politics, I do my best to see that I impact my fellow women. I am an advocate of empowerment and supporting women in politics by mentoring to them my experiences and then by telling them these are the ways for us to follow, to reach the goals that we intend to reach, or to, 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 to get to what we want to get in the governance of today. I really support, or rather accept, what this lady said. But I want to say that we women, we are not the same. We are not the same. Of course, there are bad amongst us. And I know that the problems we have, 
uh, in politics of today, we women, we don't like to help ourselves. But I want to say that there are exceptional women among us. I am not blowing my whistle, but I want to say I'm one of those women that stand to advocate for the women in politics without gaining anything or without buying for any position. But I want to see that we women are taken along in, 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 in governance. I want to give a history of what happened in 2011 when I contested and lost. Though I accept I lost, but my mandate was taken and everybody knew that. What I did then was to make a fundraising for every cost, um, person that was an aspirant to have a, a le at least some talking to assist the women. I just want you to take note of it. I lost the mandate, but I led that fundraising, managed it, raised some funds, and shared to aspirants without knowing them in the whole 36 states of the Federation. By then, the chairman of our party was just asked to give aspirants, women aspirants, that were able to win. I mean, they were able to get tickets. And uh, uh, an aspirant of senator was just here a click in her account, a lot in her account, donated by our group who managed to do that fundraising. So if I could do this 2011 to assist my fellow women to buy for the positions they want to do that, then I want to tell my fellow women that let us not lose hope. Let us keep on doing the good. Amongst us who are good, who want to say that they help the women, we keep on doing it. By the grace of God, one day we'll reach there. But I want to say that what Dr. Ramatu said about um, delegates, it is true. But that delegate uh, issue will not make women lose up in keep keeping struggling to see that they attain their positions. I know it is not good what they do, but they themselves, they will come to regret in the mere future. Because one day their own daughters, those that are depriving that we at the moment struggling or doing the politicking with them, one day their own daughters will also be victims of this circumstance. But I want to say that we keep on trying, we keep on struggling, we are not going to rest until we attend to the position that we want to attend. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, I want to ask Mrs. Mrs. Ravi Adamusa <laughs> a question. Especially, you mentioned that you're the youngest person, youngest aspirant running yeah. for the position. And Dr. Ramatu mentioned that um, being a woman running for office, there are certain specific kinds of harassment that you might face. And I would, I would like to find out if you have experienced any kinds of targeted discrimination because of your gender and because of your age. Well, um, for me, I will say that um, maybe once someone has tried to maybe, <laughs> will I use down the word mess with me, but I made it very clear. I'm someone who, is, uh, who always stands my ground. I mean, I, my, wife, my, my husband just married me and I'm so in love with my husband, so I keep telling them. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't think um, one thing you have to understand is that as a woman in politics, especially a young woman, some of the women, why they don't grow, like she said, is because they like to compromise. And honestly, as a woman in politics, you have to be brave. Politics is not for the faint at heart. You have to be very brave. You always have to stand your ground. Even when you see people, you know, trying to um, make passes at you, trying to patronize you, and all that. Just tie your grounds and make them understand. And let me tell you, a lot of these men get scared of such women. Most women that you know succeed in most, most women that have a history of um, a successful political career is because they are very decent women. If you say you're a politician and you decide, okay, you know, because from this part of the world that we are, once you say you're a politician, first and foremost, they will think you're wayward. That's the first thing that comes to everybody's mind. You're wayward. But it's not true. Because I am a politician, 
I'm a lawyer and I'm a wife, I'm a mother, and I'm very proud of my husband anytime, anywhere, my daughter too. Okay, so, so now I have to ask my next question, which is like, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how important is it to have a husband if you are trying to, if you are it's trying to It's very important in politics. Wow, okay. We're not discouraging the young, um, the um, single ladies, right? But honestly, like for example, I wanted to contest for this seat since 2015. I've been eyeing the seat since 2015. But yes, I was not um, up to the age because then the age for to contest for state assembly was like 30. I think it was like 30 or so. But now it's 25. So, you know, at least I decided that, okay, I'll wait until 2019 before I'll contest. And yes, one of the reasons, apart from my age at that time, one of the reasons that made me not to really want to come out and contest was because I was still single then. But I knew that, okay, somehow along the line, I was going to get married and all that. So it would be better for me to contest for a seat when I'm married because that way you have more respect and people around you, you know, will so, to support you. So now, so now I want to ask, what, what are the ways in which Nigerian and maybe specifically Northern social conservatism impact the kind of access that women have to elected office? If, for instance, you say that, I mean, I know it's, it's not a a phenomenon that's specific or unique to running for office. In Nigeria in general, the idea that a, a, a husband validates a woman's ambitions is very common. So is it more pronounced, is this sort of conservatism more pronounced when you're running for office? And do you think there are any ways to effectively challenge this, these types of ideas that a woman can run regardless of her marital status? Because in the end, her marital status actually has no bearing on her ability to perform in office. Well, for me, I think we should support um, women as long as you're a woman, whether you're married or you're not married, as long as you're competent, right? Not just a woman, as long as you're a woman and you're competent, yes. I think people should support you. But it's just unfortunate that honestly, once you, I mean, I know of someone very close to me who is also contesting for a seat. But right now, she had to just give up because she. People are making it very clear to her, look, you, there's no, it's impossible for you to win because you're, first, she's even a single mother in her own case. You understand? So you can imagine. So they already see that as a problem. You understand? So I think, um, not that we want to discourage things, but honestly, to excel more in this political career, you should have at least a backup. Someone you can say, look, this is my husband. There's what you, we, they, we, they're always telling us women, you know, most of these men, they feel as a woman, Already, your intelligence is intimidating some men. Exactly. If you're intelligent as a woman, some women feel some men feel intimidated by you. They feel, look, I cannot. Me, I have had that issue. I know of people that when I was growing up, they'll tell me, "Rabbi, you talk too much." And me, I will tell them, "Look, I am a lawyer <laughs> by profession. I mean, I am paid to talk. So why shouldn't I talk? Do you understand? So you know, all these kinds of things. You know, there are a lot of issues, honestly. So as a woman, I think the best thing for you is this. Just have your respect. For example, I know sometimes it's very difficult for my husband. You understand? Because there are times when I have to go out there and, you know, for meetings with men like him and all that, you know. But I always, there's a way you always, you know, a woman, you, you, should, you know, if you're in the bedroom, you have to talk to him softly. Like, look, you have to understand. You know, I need this thing. This will really add to my career and everything. And look, when I become, me, I, I, before my husband married me, I told him, I said, look, for me, I'll not lie to you. You know, it's not as if I don't like any, but you have to understand that I'm very ambitious. And yes, I want to make a difference. I like to touch lives a lot. And one thing you have to understand is that if I don't go out there, I cannot do all those things. And again, you know, I respect and I love you. But please, I want you to give me all that support, you know? Oh, <laughs> yes, I want you to give me all that support. And you know, if you support me, the society, they have eyes, they're seeing it. You know, they're seeing it. And once they see that your husband supports you 100%, they'll be like, wow, we want to support this woman because it means she has respect for her husband. Yeah, so that's it. So we're negotiating with the public space and also within the private space. It seems like you can't win. <laughs> Dr. Reverend, do you want to add something? Well, apparently that takes us to the issue of the other room. <laughs> And again, we will give it to, uh, uh, we borrow a leaf from the submission of Budaji Karuzawuri on the floor. He says, this woman, <laughs> if you leave this woman, 
You see, that speaks to you about the psyche. But we'll get to that. The issue of, issue of um, immediate enlightenment to redefine what they think about women, you know, in position of power. And then also our attitude to having get, gotten there or when we get there uh, uh, to make sure we are exemplary. So others, we see that we are actually uh, not the minus vibes they've had, you know, in their heads for a very long time. But when you look at generally what we have today, I want to appraise the women setting itself. Because whatever you do, the cleansing that is external and it's not within, you will not get to the solution of the, uh, you know, the problem. How much more the solution of the issue? Do we actually like ourselves? Honestly, in every uh, election, if ballot boxes were to be opened and thumbprints of women to be picked, the women that voted for women will be few. But I want to put it in the past. That's why I'm saying voted. We want to see the women that will vote for women this time around make the difference because we do have the numerical strength, which we are not using. Why aren't we using it? Why is her attitude your problem? Why is, is her competence your scare? Instead of turning it to something you should look up to and humiliate that I want to get there, I want to be like, uh, you know, uh, 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 Oprah Winfrey, I want to move there like uh, all those names you call, call the ones within your country and your immediate environment. I want to be like Isma. She wrote a book, despite being a wife and a mother. This place she could sit comfortably as the first lady. She's been before, she's been in the bush. She's, but she went out to do something, still putting her footprints in the times of time. What about us? I will give you a simple example. I was asking myself, after all these women, 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 I moved out, women, women, I've represented various places. I said, okay. Now, these men gave me a chance in Africa. I still went into contest to represent Africa in Russia, Moscow. 2018-19, this height. And I won that election. I still come back to appraise myself and look inwards. Have we come to terms with that? I'm in the immediate past national women leader of the All Progressive Congress. But for whatever reason, I lost that in my party, in my country, in my base. It's a question we'll ask ourselves for a very long time. Now you look at this, so many things contribute to election victory in Nigeria. But advocacy will streamline it too. When they get to understand, it will streamline it to competence, your capacity, and what you have to offer, rather than, I don't want to see her. She's suppressive. What is she wearing? She likes feeling cool. She's arrogant. Those are irrelevant vices. So, so do away with them, and you do away with the pull her him down syndrome within the country, and you move forward, provided that is not done within the women's space. The men will continue to look at us as just appendages on their aprons, whose voices must just give us that dream. And if you don't have that apron to hold on to, you are going nowhere. But if we tell ourselves that the apron of your fellow sister in the kitchen is that apron you need to get to where you're going, women will be places. Rwanda is leading with about 64% in the legislative. Despite the post, you know, genocide event. Because the women learned to tie in unity. They are strings to string, no matter their differences. Our differences should not be what weighs us down. We go to complain to this man. I don't like her. Okay, Isma, I don't like her. Fatima, no, let her. We always, I always want you behind me. You want me behind. So who will be ahead? Must be a man and a man and a man. So when do you come forward? You become the underdog again because these men you are engaging to do this for you are those men you want to beat in the ring. Obviously, you are not contesting. But you are comfortable with having one nunkumpoop or one underdog to be that person that leads. And then that person that leads is expected to go and challenge a competent one somewhere who happens to be a man. And you now say, it's because he's a woman, it's gender. Hell no. It's about you, your choice of representative, your collectivity, your unity, your love, your bond for one another. 
we are rising up to this occasion. We are speaking worldwide. The same thing I will tell them in Moscow. We are speaking. Some of you, I'm still dreaming. And I'm still drumming it with him. If you speak to your husbands coming to the function of the other room, speak positively about women. Get them, honey, at least. Let Kaduna be leading. Let them say uh, uh, you are the most gender friendly. In fact, I'll organize that award for you internationally. <laughs> yes? Go, 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 go out to do that. That's lobbying. Get him to get at least 10 commissioners, not SAs. Not SAs, the other room function. Yes, I'm so sorry to cut you off, but I think that brings me to a question that I had about who the onus is on to increase women's participation. Because I understand that there's the idea that naturally, since women have a self-interest in advancing the cause of other women, then you know women should support women. But is there a way to, trans to spread or even to transfer the responsibility for increasing women's access to the people who currently have power? Because it seems as if women are fighting mostly from the outside. So is there a way that, that advocacy can hold men who are currently in power accountable for divesting some of that power to competent women? Yes. Um, I think the, the only way is to see that we women, we organize ourselves for seminars, uh, and then at the same time go on air through the media, you know, propaganda on the issue of uh, inclusiveness in everything they do in governance. And then we, the women, we go down to the wards, organize our fellow women for meetings and the sensitization, you know, encouraging the women to keep on, you know, striving hard without relenting. And then the government as well should also give us support because we cannot go anywhere without their support. You can see Dr. Ramatu has keep on nagging or rather repeating that governors have the ultimate say. Whether we like it or not, they have the ultimate say in the states. We are not talking about the national. And then within the states, if they're able to do something to encourage an enabling environment for the women, and then really, not really on paper, or just mere saying, make it practical by at least choosing the competent among the women to put them on helm of affairs, or to encourage them by at least, uh, in so many ways, whereby they will be able to spread the knowledge to the common uh, person from the wards to the state and uh, wh what have you. And uh, apart from that, just like she has spoken, there's this envy within us, the women. We don't like ourselves. But if we want to attain the position we want to attain, then we have to start liking ourselves, believing in ourselves, recognizing that we have the potentials, you know, to, 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 to be where the men are. And uh, sincerely speaking, left to me, I think everybody is awoken now. The men also have realized that they cannot do without the women. Because if they can do with other women, then uh, if we give them a space, they are not going anywhere. The politicking, they have to go with the women. The votes, 60% of the votes are coming from the women and youth. Therefore, women are important in all ramifications of life and in every aspect of life. So what they need to do is to understand that the nation at, as, as we are now, we are in a situation whereby we need ourselves at least to improve the economically, socially, and otherwise. And the best thing for them is to allow the competent women, not just all women, the competent among the women should be recognized and be carried along or assisted or supported in, 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 in so many ways. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so my last question before we open the floor will be to you, Mrs. Binter. Um, so you've done work with marginalized populations, less privileged in Plateau State and, and in Kaduna, I believe. What do you think your responsibility as a politician and as a woman politician seeking the support? Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Rafi, sorry. As a, um, uh, a woman politician seeking support from women, women citizens, what do you think your responsibility is to women citizens? And do you think that if you execute that responsibility, it can increase the faith of women voters in women politicians? Um, my responsibility basically, and what I've been doing it for a very long time now, is to advocate for more women in parliament, for more for inclusiveness, you know, for women in government. And again, we have to do that by way of um, making sure that we have, like I said, more women in the parliament. Because there are some laws that, you know, if we women are there in the parliament, we are we're able to make those kind of laws that will affect women, you understand? So do you think that women being in elected office automatically translates to better outcomes for I think women so. voters? Yes, I think so. What I want to say about this issue of women in politics is that what I'm going to say may not be popular, but really the women themselves have to look inwards. In Kaduna State here, when my husband became governor, of course, I had experience with a lot of these so-called women politicians. You understand, if you want to make a difference, you have to improve yourself and make yourself worthy of the positions that you want to be given. That's number one. Some of them just think that they are politicians and that's it mm -hmm. because they can mobilize crowd. When the issue of giving appointment comes, they will look at your CV. What have you done? You know, they can't just give you because you just happen to be a woman or you can mobilize. Because frankly, let me tell you, that's why I said it might not be popular. I will not vote for a woman solely because she's a woman. I will not. If I have two candidates, a man and a woman, and the woman is not somebody I feel is worthy of my votes, I will not vote for her. But an another way of doing this, trying to bridge the gap, is in terms of affirmative action. Mm. I think we should try and advocate for that, whereby you can say in a state, maybe House of Assembly, you can leave, if there are like 20 seats, you can leave a certain number of seats for women. In that case, for that seat, only women will contest for that. Mm. And then you'll be able to choose who is the most competent That's woman awesome. amongst the ones that are vying for that position. Yeah. You know, that's a way of doing it. But in an open contest where you have men and women, I will not vote necessarily for a woman just because she happens to be a woman. Yeah. So we women have to up our own game. And also in terms of behavior, I'm sorry to say a lot of our women politicians, the way they even carry themselves, hmm. you know? When you want to be taken seriously, you go to a meeting with the men, you sit, you're serious. You don't allow people to joke with you that you know that is can sometimes be perceived to be like crossing a line. Mm. You understand? You have to stand your ground. Or when you have a group, or there's a meeting, or there's going to be a conference, and then they say, "Okay, the women will go to the welfare committee." Why will I be in the welfare? Why, why will I not be in the finance committee? Yes. <laughs> or they bring refreshments and they say, "Okay, I'm done. Start serving." Why will I serve? So it depends on how you take yourself. We have to start taking ourselves seriously. But believe me, if I see a woman that is competent, I will certainly vote for her. Thank you, you very know? much. Thank you. Um, I do think that there's, there's a, there might be an unfair expectation on women to be more competent and the assumption that men by, by default are competent. And I, I just want us to keep that potential bias in mind because it's like, I think we can be, we can all agree that generally we expect women to work twice as hard to get half the results. My name is Furira. Um, two short comments. First is, uh, I have read Love Does Not Win Election by Aisha. And I think it should be going into election or going into politics 101 for young women going into politics. 
I think when you read them. But um, important, uh, around Asia, the same developing countries like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, including conservative, so-called conservative Muslim countries. We've had prime ministers, presidents, and we still do. And Rwanda has more women in the parliament. Has there been, an, has a study been done or is there insight into what has happened in these countries? These are so-called conservative countries to some of them. Has there been insight, a study or something that we as or uh, women politicians in Nigeria can take away and use to their advantage. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm interested in your opinion on female quota in Nigeria. I know it's something that's been discussed in a lot of countries. I'd like to know what you think about that and if that could be implemented in our society, also in politics specifically. You are wrong to say women leaders. The term is woman leader. The history Political Bureau Report, 1986. Analyze the First Republic, identified two key problems, marginalization of the youth, marginalization of the women. They recommended that because the parties of the Second Republic, I mean of the First Republic, none of them ever had a woman in National Executive Committee. That should change. 1989 Electoral Act, they put in this provision at the four levels of party organization, ward, local government, state, national, there must be a woman leader and a youth leader in the executive committee. It then became, as Dr. Ramatu said, tokenism because it meant in leadership at every level, you can only have one woman. That wasn't the intention of the law. The law said there must be at least one woman. But the practice then be became there must be only one woman. One minute history. Thank you very much for that insightful history lesson. Um, so we're just going to respond to the questions in case, do we, do we remember what the questions were? So the first one was, what is the role, or well, there was, a, I'm aggregating the questions, what is the role of affirmative action or quotas in advancing the cause of women's participation in politics? And then are there any studies that have been conducted in other conservative societies that we can adapt to our local context to increase women's participation? And then what are the practical solutions to the challenges and who do you think should be responsible for implementing those solutions? Okay. Well, I'll start from the last one you omitted. You just gave one minute brief of the genesis of woman leader, women leader issue. That takes us to still the attitude of women. That woman leader, the woman leader was even more applicable and gave the women more strength at Benicio because she was just one woman leader amongst them, even though at least a woman, a woman leader and any other. But she could now advocate, speak on other things, and you know, delve into various other issues. Then the women started. Not woman leader, women leader. The women leader now reduced and streamlines the, you know, the strength of the woman leader at the helm of affairs, either state, local government, or national. Because she's just seen as leader of women rather than a female leader and miss men that could take decision and but in function yes she will go to the caucuses she will go to every other function and do but when she comes to say mm, you see your women we did that to ourselves even as i was in apc and tried deliberately to write woman leader it was one herculean task because they felt it's not woman leader or it's woman leader and then they own the woman they want to dictate to the woman who happens to be the leader who will be reported to the men, then the men wait for you there. When you advocate, they say, is it not the same women? They are complaining about you. So what happens to the function? That takes it down. But look at it generally, the lady that spoke about the quota. The, work, the quota system worked also in Rwanda, it worked in South Africa, and so many other in, underdeveloped countries. The quota isn't working in Nigeria. Because we are saying at least a woman. My great Ismail here just said something. 
Thank you for expediently sending the message across. It boils down to the people at the helm of affairs for today. You cannot change it in 2019 that the governors are indeed in charge of our delegates, of the electoral system, of who becomes what. Yeah. So we are using this medium to still appeal to the wives, please. Use the function of the other room to speak to our governors and our leaders to please do something out of the box. We are getting, you know, I get ashamed sometimes, like I'll be going to Russia. The question, oh, will be on Nigeria. You are this vocal. What is wrong? I don't even know how I start addressing. You just lost your election. Uh, we watched it live. <laughs> the Council of African Political Parties streamlined it. What do we have to say on that? And then it was even basically more of the challenges. See, look, what we do, so, do to ourselves, you cannot sow what, you know, reap what you did not sow. But look generally inwards, she said it again. Inwards at you, me, me, bury the differences, bury the hatchets, that the decision is that we just said something here, and I think it should transcend beyond this classroom. We saw, you know, the capacity. We saw a substance in this young lady. The mentorship comes. The lobbying must go. Because some people have already taken the lead. So it's not by the general, you know, a, a great, Greek gift, I call it. And she's a woman, come. She's a woman leader. You are giving me just what belongs to me. What about what I've acquired just like you? Thank you very what much. What about what I've acquired that will take me places just like you or better than you? then you must have the teeming support of the gender to forget about who you are. A Muslim, a Christian, what do you do? Your arrogance, forget it, even in the men. You don't get those what their enemies on bended knees. You don't get them picking your bags and holding your briefcase. You get them at the research centers. You get them where they all got ought to be. Then if you want credible and competent representation, please go out for them. You don't need to wait to anoint someone who is your boy or your girl or your girl bag picker and you want her there and you want the nation to go somewhere. For crying out loud, we've got to rise up to this occasion and then diversify the pool of female uh, uh, aspirants and candidates. When we do that, irrespective of, you know, uh, 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 class, barrier, uh, uh, ethnicity, religion, we get competent women that will give versatility, versatility and challenge to leadership. Women will do tremendously well. Don't get the, women scared, the men scared of. They are scared of the competent women. So why are you also scared of the competent women instead of holding on to their aprons? You go for the men's sagbada to fall her down and you expect the country to move forward and you expect gender to go forward. Then you say the men are not giving us spaces. Give ourselves the spaces. Power is not served a la carte. Power Thank you very taken. much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that powerful conclusion. Okay, so, um, Mrs. Ravi, I just wrote some recommendations. Which Please, I think one I house. One house. So I just made some recommendations. I wrote it out here, and I think maybe I should just read it out. And it says, um, it must be recognized that the principle of equal rights of men and women is enshrined in the Nigerian Constitution. Article 42 guarantees right to freedom from discrimination on the grounds of sex. In addition, the Nigerian gender policy prescribes that at least 35% of political leaders, political le leadership be given to women. So what I would like to recommend here is this. First and foremost, the government should please make commitments to address challenges holding women and girls down, implement the gender policy immediately, and ensure that women constitute at least 35% of women appointment and increase it gradually to 50% by 2030. We should amend the constitution to provide for affirmative action for women, abrogate all laws that are discriminatory to women and repugnant to natural justice, implement a gender agenda, and for political parties, ensure that women occupy leadership positions in the political party structure, support women candidates during elections and appointments, and give waivers to women in payment of nomination fees. Thank you very much for those concrete recommendations. And <laughs> um, what I will want to say is about the affirmative uh, action that I urge the government to see that is, uh, is done.
By doing so, it will help the women in politics to get where they want to go. But I want to urge my fellow women to know that politics is local. You have to start from somewhere. And that place that you need to start is your home, your base. When you are there, you impact on your fellow women, youth, and other people that are there. You are spared from there. That is where your potentials will be judged. Or that is where they will know who you are, what you have to give. Because politics is for the, for, for the people, by the people. And you get to be there for the people. You have to be approachable. You, your doors have to be open. You have to listen to people. And you have to go along with the people. You bring down yourself. Bring down yourself to the to, to the drotten, down, down. You need just to blend with people. That is when you will be accepted. That is when you will be believed that, yes, you've got the potentials, the qualities, the listening ears. Because there's no point you get there and then you are, you are difficult to be assessed. You, you, are, you are not allowed to, 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 to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly within the where you come from. You need to let yourself accessible. You need to accept people from the downtrodden. You need just to start from the home. Politics is local. When you are good, you are accessible. People have judged your potentials. You can deliver. Then you will have all the support. And I want to say that we women, we have this. If few of us are opportuned, are appointed, we forget our own fellow women down. We forget. Look at what just my dear sister here or my daughter has said. She met some of us who have contested, who are somebody in the, in the country in terms of politics. Before her eyes, they rejected and assisted her, mentoring her. You can imagine. So we women, we have problem ourselves. So I urge we women to unite, to know who we are, that God has given us gift of leadership more than the men because we're very compassionate, very sensitive very uh, God-fearing. I wouldn't say all of us are perfect, but majority of us, I'm telling you, but if, 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 we, if, we, if we really uh, get ourselves united, and then we, we listen to, to those that are less privileged, we will impact a lot on a lot of people, and then we'll get to where we want to go. This is my own question. Thank you very much. So Dr. Ramatu wants to give us just a one minute. Yeah, just one minute to assist um, uh, uh, Mrs. Rabi Adabu here. Looking at, in choosing a mentor, let there be so many variables. You should also assess to see who can mentor you. First point. Secondly, so many of the women there you find are not even actually what you think. For instance, you have just one woman in that place, be it the National Assembly, the woman leader, state level, what else, she was just, just a senator. We, we've advocated so many times to even have the implementation, adequate implementation of the 35% affirmative action. It gets kicked out because they are just decimal. They are yet to attain, you know, the, 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 the pool. And that is why most of the time, some of the people are not explicit enough. She wants to keep her guards. She wants to keep, you know, maintaining and forming big girl. She knows she cannot help. She's actually incapable, or not incapable as a person. She's not indicted. But this space is not according her, you know, the, the, the opportunity. And then you come. It's like an impossible thing. Some are too frank. They will just tell you, no. Or they will tell you, come back, and she will keep playing with your mind and your mind and your mind there should be the function of the numerical strength. Quickly get across the people. She made the point, every politics is local. Though even though rising within the locality, for each one that within your peer, hardly accept that you are getting better and you should move. They will pull you down. So at the same time, you network with the top, but make them to understand that you are there for them. It will cost you nothing. By the time that is done, all the uh, you know, uh, uh, elites, she will also unite quickly to support women in vying for, you know, positions at the local level. This will strengthen them. It will get them, you know, design programs that will expose them to politics, that will give them the required experience to meet male counterparts. And then they will also qualify 
and will be as adequately equipped to contest for national seats. You must be a card carrying member of a political party. Mind you, you must also register, struggle to contest as a delegate. Get many women as much as possible because they will do the voting. Now that the APC is also advocating for you know, the indirect primaries, it will go a long way because you will have a voice. Let the numerical strength speak. Get your phone numbers together. Speak to yourselves. Don't say she's forming big girl. She passed me. Talk to her. I swear, if you don't give me your number, I will not let you go because she will have a word. Hold this woman in Kaduna. Come after this one. She will speak to the villa. Perhaps I'll be able to do something within the party. There is a network even across Africa now that we might begin to move to form, you know, trans country, uh, you know, uh, 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 caucuses. We mandate you to also form little caucuses that will give you the voice to stand up and rise up to the occasion of challenging. But you must get the buy-in of the men who, oh, I didn't say go fight them. Get their buy-in, but she said it. Stand tall. Be what your onions. Know what you are doing. Do not go for what you cannot do because you think you are a woman and it should be given to you. I will not vote for you. She just said she will not, and I know she will not. Be competent. If they pull you down tomorrow, you get up again next tomorrow. There is every constant thing. It is not falling. That is the issue. Rising each time we fall. We fall so many times to get to where we are going, but the point is we get to where we are going. Women are surely going to give places in Nigeria. Thank you very much. So, I think that we will know that we have reached equal political representation, and not just political, but representation for women in general, when women are not just required to succeed, but women also have space to fail comparably to the space that men have to fail.